What's up, superstar? Happy Friday Eve. It's Thursday, January 11th. Rise up. Let's make this a random thought Thursday. If you are trying to fail and you succeed, does that mean you're successful and not a failure? <laughs> Let's start today with a quick update on the current state of the U.S. economy. As we begin 2024, the economy is at a crossroads, and some analysts believe this year will be a pivotal year with a strong influence on how the remainder of this decade will go. At the end of 2023, we saw continued job growth in the labor market thanks in large part to consumer spending. Many thought the Federal Reserve's decision to continuously increase interest rates in 2023 in order to help slow inflation would lead to job losses and spin the economy into a recession. Well, that didn't happen. We're not out of the woods just yet, though. The U.S. still faces possible challenges ahead. We're seeing the least affordable housing market in the generation, both the Israel-Hamas war and Russia-Ukraine war rage on, and the 2024 presidential election could certainly have an impact on the economy. So as we consider all these potential breakthroughs and pitfalls, we might wonder just how difficult is it to define a, an economy as good or bad? It's not a simple task. Our John Sarlin breaks it down. So there's been a big debate right now raging about the economy, whether it's good, whether it's bad. But what even is a good economy? When pundits and economists talk about a good economy, they're looking at a few key metrics. The unemployment rate, GDP growth, wages, the stock market. So you can compare those numbers to years past. You can compare them to other similar economies around the world. On both those fronts right now, the U.S. is doing well. The U.S. economy is doing great relative to other economies, which makes this whole thing kind of weirder. The United States economy is doing very, very well, but people within the United States are feeling much worse than those who are in economies that are not doing as strong. So looking back to 2022, right, there was a huge debate going on about Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve's plan to raise interest rates to counteract inflation. The concern was that raising interest rates like they did could lead to widespread job losses and a possible recession. But if the Fed, in trying to head off inflation, continues to raise interest rates as fast as it has, then the economy is going to go into recession. The Fed said they were aiming for the so-called soft landing, where you raise interest rates just enough to slow inflation, but avoid those massive job losses. So what happened? So far, the landing seemed like it was pretty soft. The inflation rate has been coming down and we haven't seen widespread job losses, but that is not to say that everything is good. So wages are growing, sure, that's great, but that doesn't offset 40 years of stagnant wages. We have an affordability crisis. It's almost impossible to get a house in the United States. People are coming out of the other side of the pandemic and they're like, oh wow, like, you know, student loan payments can be paused. I'm able to, I was able to kind of afford rent. I was able to have unemployment insurance. And then all of a sudden, all that's taken away. I think of course people are going to be genuinely upset about that and genuinely frustrated. All right, let's turn now to social media, specifically tech giant Meta, which owns Instagram and Facebook. The company has announced new settings for teen users. Our medical correspondent, Meg Terrell, was on CNN recently to discuss the impact of these changes. Well, it sounds like it is a pretty significant change. Meta has already had a lot of protections, they say, in place for teen users, but a lot of pressure has been mounting on them recently. And so what they're doing is they're adding even more protection. So around search terms like self-harm and suicide and eating disorder, they're going to hide even more kinds of content, even among people that teens follow on these platforms. They're not going to show them if somebody posts about those things. Uh, they're also automatically setting teens in the most restrictive content settings. So right now it's when you sign up, they put you in that setting. Now they're going to do it for all teens automatically. And they're also going to be sending notifications to prompt teens to update their privacy settings with a single tap. So all of this, of course, comes amid this backdrop that really started a couple years ago with the Francis Haugen Facebook Papers coming out, uh, which uh, blew the whistle, including on things like uh, young girls' self-image. So that was one thing that was really focused on there. Of course, in the middle of last year, the Surgeon General put out an advisory about kids' mental health and social media. States have now sued Meta, alleging harms to children. And then a second whistleblower coming out at the end of last year saying that Meta executives uh, alleging that they knew about these kinds of harms and weren't acting on them. And so there's also federal legislation pending. So these companies are under a lot of pressure. 
Let it go, let it go. <laughs> Princess Elsa, Anna, and Olaf—they're pretty big deals in the Wire household, thanks to my two young daughters. And right now, we're gonna head to China, to a place where more than thirty thousand people per day from around the world flock to check out a frozen wonderland. Here's CNN's Leila Harak with more. It's a winter wonderland you won't see anywhere else. The Chinese city of Harbin saw a record number of visitors over the New Year holiday weekend during its annual Ice and Snow Festival. While this ice city features intricate sculptures and structures, all glowing from within, all of course made entirely of ice. It's quite nice and quite shocking. When I saw it for the first time, I thought they built it very well, and the ice was very transparent. Well, this year officials say an average of about 30,000 people enter the park every day. That's nearly double pre-pandemic numbers. Well, the festivities have sold out every hotel. Booking was pretty difficult. For booking hotels, we spent two to three days before we found a suitable hotel. Tickets for Ice and Snow World were sold out online, so I bought them on the second-hand website Xi'an Yu. State media says this year's festival covers 810,000 square meters, nearly nine million square feet, and features 250,000 cubic meters of ice. A rather fitting spectacle as temperatures over the New Year holiday drop to nearly minus 25 degrees Celsius or minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit. But the cold hardly stopped those itching for fun after the last three years of holiday cheer. Were stifled by varying degrees of pandemic restrictions. Because this is the first winter holiday since the pandemic was lifted, and everyone can't hold back. We've been sealed for several years, so we want to go out and relax to release some of the stressful feelings from the pandemic. Harbin's Ice Festival will shine bright until early March. In the meantime, the aptly nicknamed Ice City shares its ice, art, and animals with visitors. Looking for something cool to do. Ten-second trivia: What is the largest cat that lives in North America? Bobcat, puma, ocelot, or jaguar? If you said jaguar, ding, 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 you are correct. They once roamed throughout the southwestern U.S., but they've been on the endangered species list since 1997. Today's story, getting a 10 out of 10, gives us great pause. After five years of setting up trail cameras in the Arizona wilderness in hopes of spotting the elusive jaguar, wildlife photographer Jason Miller finally put the cat in catch. CNN affiliate KGUN9's Ryan Fish has more. A jaguar seemingly posing for the camera. This one has never been photographed in the U.S. before. That's mind blowing. I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. <laughs> Need one haystack. It's the holy grail for me. It's a moment Jason's been chasing for years. Why a jaguar? Why was that your goal? Well, when I got into trail cameras, it was a few years after that.、Uh, I think it was El Hefe. Was in the San Ritas. Who wouldn't want to try to get, you know, a, a jaguar on on camera? Jason named this one Cochise. Arizona Game and Fish says it's only the eighth unique jaguar spotted in the U.S. since the 90s. The first since 2016. The exotic big cats are known to move between Arizona and Sonora, Mexico. You can't do anything to an endangered species. You can't hunt it, obviously, kill it, or harass it in any way. You really can't track it. And that's why the trail camera technology is so valuable. They're being seen in their natural environment, moving about normally. Congratulations to Jason Miller. He worked really hard to get that those images, and he's provided us with the information we need to protect it. Though Jason's been sharing his footage online long before this milestone. You know, my wife and my daughter can't wait. You know, to see what I get when I come home. There's people out there that get the smile on their face like I do when I check my cameras. Especially, you know, people that can't go out there and do it. Well done, Jason. You're a great roar model. Being dedicated to your goal and persisting in your pursuits. You must have been feline so proud. Hey, why did the jaguar refuse to play poker anymore? Because all the other players were cheetahs. All right, shout out time now. This shout out is going to. The felines at Meadow Bridge High School in Meadow Bridge, West Virginia. We see you, Wildcats. And this shout out goes to the Warriors at Kapolei Middle School in Oahu, Hawaii. Aloha. I'm Koi Wire, and we are CNN 10.